from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now, here's your host, Stu Miniman. Hi, and welcome to a special presentation of Cube Conversations here in our Boston area studio. Happy to welcome back to the program. It's been a little while. Uh, Brian Regan, who's the Chief Marketing Officer at uh, a local company, Actifio. We've been watching since the early days. Brian, so good to see you. Great to see you, Stu. Thanks for having me in. All right, so uh, Brian, you know, it, it, it comes as no surprise to you. <laughs> you know, you, you've worked on it, but uh, in, in this industry for many years. But when we, we've looked at kind of our predictions at a Wikibon community, no matter which one of these big mega trends we're talking about, whether you're talking machine learning, IoT, cloud, you know, data sits at the center of it and really is, you know, super critical. Uh, th there's the old tried and true, you know, data is the new oil. Uh, but you know, why don't bring us up to speed? You know, Tifio is, is a company that people probably started at as you know, as it's in this you know weird you know storage ecosystem today. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think data is also at the center of your business. Absolutely. I mean, if you uh, you know, if you think just really simply um, about any business in the world. They have customers, they have partners, they have products, they have employees, all that's data. And, and the problem with data these days is it just keeps getting big, and when it's big, it's slow. And it's slow to use for application development, it's slow to use for insights and analytics, it's just slow to use if you want to move to the cloud. Um, you know, Actifio has really been in business for you know, nearly nine years now. Um, you know, to help virtualize that data, make it more portable, make it easier to use, for all those reasons to help drive those businesses. And that is that is our value proposition. You're right, we, we sort of started in that sort of, are you a storage company? Uh, you know, we're storage agnostic and today we're cloud agnostic. It's about the data. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, it, it's really, you're a software company, correct? We're a software company. So, uh, you, you hit on a key, key thing that I, I've looked at for a while is, Everybody's talking about how do how do I as a company how do I become more agile how do yep. I move faster you know CI/CD is kind of yep. you know uh, table stakes these days for so many companies how does Actifio help companies prevent you know that storage from being you know an anchor weighing them down and slowing them down Sure sure yeah. I mean CI/CD is great and it, you can move at speed as long as you're talking about very lightweight elements of an application the json files the xml all the all those lightweight application elements you know logic um, but when it comes to that big database sitting behind the scenes that's actually powering that application that's the gravitational pull that slows ci cd down um, typically that we've seen it take 80 plus percent of the software development life cycle just to stand up those environments so people make compromises they subset it they do all the the crazy things to try and avoid the storage or infrastructure infrastructure tax when it comes to setting up those environments. Um, we can help bypass that. Again, it's virtual data, so now we can start to port it, we can move it, we can uh, parallelize it, and we can get it ready for these developers through our automation and orchestration in minutes as opposed to hours or days in many cases for the service levels. All right, so Brian, you mentioned developers there. Yeah. Uh, you know, definitely kind of the infrastructure world has been like, oh gosh, how do we deal <laughs> with developers? How do we fit in this whole world? Yeah. Uh, you know, DevOps and yeah. like infrastructure a lot of times when oil and water. What are you hearing from your customers? How does that play mm -hmm. into you know, what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, developers for us are the consumers, right? They are the, the end users of that data. And the infrastructure team or the operations or DBA teams are really the, the, uh, the providers of that data. And they have to stand it up, they have to stand up the infrastructure, they have to stand up the data, they have to do all the roles, uh, you know, log roles and the like, and data prep. Um, and so if we can help them really collapse that time to access the data, because it's always in its native format, um, prep the data so it's ready for use, and then parallelize it so that way we can actually do multiple test streams or multiple development streams, or we can you know, do those more agile scrum projects and, and get more done in a given calendar quarter. Um, now all of a sudden those consumers are happier because they're getting the data in its full state um, more of it more rapidly than they ever have. And the operations teams are, are happy because they don't have to buy more storage to do it. They can actually go on and do other projects instead of have to sit there and manually get data set for developers. You know, one of the challenges we hear from customers these days is right where they develop it and how they do that versus production, very different. A lot of times, 
some things have been doing in my data center, some yep. are in the, you know, the public cloud. How does the, the whole kind of, you know, where it lives fit into yep. uh, your environment? Uh, I, I know, uh, Tiffany, you just had a kind of big announcement around some of your cloud pieces. Sure, yeah. sure. We just released our, uh, our eighth uh, major release of our software since our founding. Um, and it was really, probably from an engineering time standpoint, the largest release since our first one. Um, and it was very cloud-centric. Uh, our starting point um, as a company was really to try and be infrastructure agnostic. Wherever you wanted to put your data from a storage or compute standpoint, we wanted to give you that, that freedom to do so. Um, now it's just as relevant in the cloud. You should be able to choose the cloud um, for the given workload or the given data payload. You know, Don't have to get frozen into one or locked into one lets you choose, and then also, once you've chosen, give you the freedom to actually port from cloud to cloud if need be, uh, because you might choose, whether it's economic arbitrage or whether it's just different PaaS capabilities and different clouds suitable for different workloads. We want to give you that freedom. All right, but, you know, Public cloud, come on, it's supposed to be easy. They've got you know so <laughs> many features. Yeah. What's the gap? If I'm deploying, you know, to choose your favorite public cloud, whether yep. AWS, Azure, yep. GCP, Oracle, IBM, et cetera. Sure. sure. What, what, what's, what's, the, what's the piece that Actifio delivers that's still needed by customers yeah. that's not kind of native? It just comes back to that data. Yeah. Boy, it's, it's always the data. It's always the can that gets kicked down the road because again, those lightweight elements of applications are so easy to move and then we just get stuck with this big, gravitational pull of data. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the fallacy or the, the popular you know, myth about public cloud is yeah, it's going to be easier and it's going to be cheaper. Um, and uh, it can be both. Um, and it can be both, particularly when you can get the data in there and it's in a suitable state to actually use for these development analytics, all these different um, workload characteristics that um, while it's stuck in you know non-native format in its very large state, it's it just it's unusable in those clouds. Yeah, Brian, you, you meet with a lot of customers. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been doing a lot of travel recently. Yes. A any specific stories you can sell or kind of you know aggregate? You know what what are they struggling with with cloud? What's working well with them? Yeah. And, uh, if, of course, you know how, how you're fitting into that. Yeah, it's uh, you know there's there's sort of three camps uh, that that I've seen over the the last several weeks particularly. There's the camp that. Uh, whether it's regulatory pressures or just internal policy, they're not going to move. But they still want to change their operating model to a cloud model. And so they're implementing and instrumenting their internal environments, their private cloud, um, to operate just like an Amazon or Azure or Google, but all behind the firewall. Um, and they still need all of that capability for the data automation. They want their data on demand for those applications. They want self-service. They want infrastructure as code. And they want to take advantage of Actifio to help power that internal cloud. That's camp one. And that's you know, still a pretty hefty camp. Camp two is, you know, I would call more traditional companies who are not born in the cloud, but have embraced the cloud and really want a fast on-ramp to get their data into one or more public clouds so they can get out of the data center business. And they're using Actifio really as an on-ramp first, but then once it gets into the cloud, they're using the native data management capabilities that they can take advantage of in the public cloud um, so they can keep their agility moving at the speed of their VMs, at the speed of their, uh, their lightweight components. Um, and then the third camp, which has really been interesting to watch, is the born in the cloud guys. Um, and really starting to realize that they're, the native capabilities of these public clouds are very powerful, but they don't really take the place of traditional backup, for example. There is no backup software native inside of AWS. An EBS snapshot is a great snapshot. It's not a backup, though. Um, you can't really use it as a time machine. And when you go region to region, you do fulls. And so it becomes very heavy and very costly. So Actifio can really play a role for even those native born in the cloud applications to provide the enterprise class data management, but in a public cloud. Yeah, uh, Brian, you know, bring us up to speed. Kind of, uh, you know, how do you characterize your customers? You know, how many customers do you have? Sure. You know, how much of them are kind of the the, the new class versus you know, I, I've got you know my data center kind of yeah. kind of sitting on these things. Yep. Well, we've um, since our founding, we've really focused on that upper mid market and enterprise um, customer. We we just crossed over the three thousand customer mark um, right. the end of last quarter. Um, we operate in 37 countries today, um, and I would say you know they ran, run the gamut from the Fortune 50s to that uh, sort of Fortune 10,000s. Um, but they all they all have very common characteristics. You know, as you would expect, um, we we thrive in environments where data is growing and growing fast. We thrive where data is regulated or under some sort of internal or external pressure um, around management, um, and we really thrive in environments and industries that are 
truly embracing this digital transformation. They know that, you know, like you said, the data is the new oil. Data is their best currency today. And the fact of crypto, data is currency. Um, and so they're truly embracing that and they want to move faster. And they want to move faster with the data that they have today. And whether they choose to do that on-premise or in the cloud or in, on the, in the cloud at some point in the time, they want the freedom to make that choice when it's right for their business. All right, Brian, I have a personal question for you. You brought okay. up digital transformation. Yes. And uh, today you were in a CMO hat. You've had a number of different roles, other you know, C-suite uh, you know, roles in the past. What is the changing role of the CMO today, especially with that, that landscape of digital transformation? Right, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to watch um, just the, the change of what I, my budget line items are aligned around. Um, you know, I probably spend uh, as much on software um, and other licensed models, SaaS models, um, to support my business, to support my digital and inbound marketing efforts, to support my analytics efforts around what, what's working, what's not. How do I tune the, uh, the, the best marketing mix um, to really cater to this, you know, the changing role of a consumer of content, um, and then all of the content syndication and content marketing. So, you know, I, I um, you know, to, to some degree, I think part of the changing nature of a CMO is they have to be very technology um, focused, or I should say technology aware, um, focused on the business outcomes, but understanding how technology can play a role to really affect those business outcomes. In my case, whether that's increasing the exposure of the company, whether that's increasing the lead flow to our sales organization, whether that's um, chain, you know, uh, making our, our uh, different routes to market more optimized and enabled for you know, higher velocity sales. All of those things can be technology enabled today. So you have to be much more conscious about, and it's, it's almost like a CIO junior role inside of an, an enterprise. Yeah, uh, really interesting, right? We've, we've debated for years, you know, you know, where will the IT budget be driven from? Uh, sounds like you, you've got an impact on that. Um, I, I love the discussion you talked about, you know, kind of how technology is helping to transform businesses. Uh, do you have any customer examples, customers that are just doing some cool stuff with technology yeah. uh, that could kind of be useful? So um, I'm, I'm going to go use a, uh, a company that would probably be the last industry you would expect me to, uh, to, <laughs> to bring up, but I think they're a fascinating use case. Um, so Waste Industries is okay. a, um, they're in the trash disposal business. Yeah. Um, and as, as the CIO has corrected me on numerous occasions, it's okay to say the word trash. <laughs> um, and um, so we were talking, they're using, they used Actifio first to help them solve, you know, very classic, modernize my DR um, strategy, um, you know, part of the business. But then they started to realize that the power of using that data for other purposes to accelerate analytics. Um, because it turns out in the trash disposal business, um, they actually instrument a lot of, they instrument their trucks, they instrument with sensors their canisters, they do route optimizations based on data that they're getting from all of these devices. So as this CIO is fond of saying, they're not in the internet of things, they're in the internet of trash. And so they're using data to help them be a much more innovative and, and frankly optimized organization today. And then as they start to think about where the future of their business goes, now that they're starting to become a data company, they can start to really comprehend what, do we, what does it look like with autonomous vehicles in trash disposal? What does it look like in terms of you know, using uh, different types of vehicles to do routes? Maybe even uh, an Airbnb type of model or a Uber model where maybe it's not even just our people doing the, uh, the routes, but it's other organizations that we can start to sell data to to help them become a greater part of our organization. Fascinating, you know, probably the, the company on the surface that you'd think would probably not be a data company at all, but I think it personifies where we are as an industry today. Every company is a data company, and the companies that win in the market are the companies that truly embrace being a data company and taking advantage of that. Yeah, D definitely not one uh, would be first I'd be thinking <laughs> of. All right, Brett, last question I have yeah. for you. Uh, we're heading into 2018. Yes. Uh, what should we be looking for? You know, the brain of Actifio, people that are watching. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what do we expect next year? So I think, uh, you know, very exciting year for us. We, as I mentioned, we just released this major, you know, software update. The customer adoption already has been you know tremendous we see you know really the the embracing the cloud whether it's in behind the firewall or embracing the public cloud multi-cloud um, being a big theme for us um, you know I think that you know we have uh, a Gartner analyst said to me a few weeks back he said you know you've been around you're disruptive still though uh, but you're proven and being disruptive and proven is a really powerful thing 
Um, and so, you know, we feel like we've got, you know, a great punching weight in terms of, you know, market presence. We have amazing customers in every industry. Um, we see this, you know, 2018 is a really great year to continue our scaling, continue to be, um, you know, a very profitable and growing um, organization, and, uh, and really helping to meet the needs of some of these, you know, incredibly interesting use cases um, around data in the, in the business. Wait, profitable and growing, you must be an East Coast company. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. right. Well, Brian, yeah, well, Waltham, Massachusetts, uh, pr appreciate having you on. Thank uh, you, Especially Stu. a startup right down the road here from, from our East Coast studios. Always good to, uh, talking up uh, and uh, look forward to talking to you more next Thanks year. Again. And thank you so much for watching us. Be sure to check out thecube.net for all of our interviews, all of our upcoming events, and hit us up if you have any questions. Thanks so much for watching theCUBE.